Okay. Hi everyone, I think we're gonna get started. Um, I'm, I'm so happy that everybody came out tonight instead of hearing Bill Clinton talk at the uh, convention. This is a really exciting turnout for our first speaker series event. I'd like to thank Kara um, and David Kuby for coming and organizing this event. And um, I just would like to welcome you all to the McMurray College Speaker Series. Um, David Kuby is a visiting associate professor in digital media at the University of Illinois Springfield, and he's gonna discuss his work, Lines of Division, an exhibit on display through September 28th in McMurray's Appleby Gallery. Um, just a brief sort of synopsis on the theme of the speaker series this year are topics surrounding the advancement of social justice and Kubi really exemplifies this in its exhibit by providing insight into the particular struggle rural gay or queer men face in their fight for equality and enhanced um, ability to participate in the civic quality of life and enhance the quality of life for um, their community. A brief, uh, we had talked about the use of the word queer, and um, there's sort of an irony there, which is that the word queer has sort of developed within um, primarily, I guess, urban and metropolitan settings to mean um, a general term to refer to lesbian, um, gay, questioning, transgender people. Um, and it's just a quick way to be able to say all of those things in one word. However, um, in rural communities and in, for people of the past older generations, it's still considered sometimes to be a derogatory term. So there can sometimes be an uneasiness or um, I guess an uncomfortable feeling about using these terms and hopefully we all know that this is a safe environment um, to talk. I, mean, I should have put one of those um, you know, triangles with the rainbow to say straight allies or something to, to, on the podium. But this is a, you know, we shouldn't get caught up in the terms themselves and I hope you can sort of talk about the feelings that the art evokes and the themes more than um, getting caught up in the semantics of which words that we're gonna be using tonight. Um, so I think it's interesting that most images of queer or gay America involve urban settings, but I think that Kubi shows us that another gay setting involving farmlands, religion, and conservatives, and this sort of um, overarching longing for acceptance in a community, a community where you're not really visible. Um, I went to a rural social work conference this summer, and there was a panel of uh, students from all across rural Indiana telling their stories about coming out in their commun communities. And I was sort of left with um, a, a feeling of sadness because every single story ended with the students moving to an urban area and feeling that they were accepted. So it seemed like the solution for social workers leaving that um, talk was, okay, if you want to be accepted, move. Go to an urban area where there's more diversity and a community that you could be out um, openly and accepted in. So um, obviously homophobia is one of the most enduring forms of prejudice in our culture today. And many of you will recall the insidious violence of 1998 with uh, Matthew Shepard being beaten unconscious and tied to a fence near Laramie, Wyoming. Um, and he died from his injuries of that attack. So um, in the decades since that tragedy, there have been a lot of research done on suicide suicide rates um, increasing for queer or gay students. And um, obviously, I think that a lot of lesbian and gay people in rural communities really do fear discrimination in the sense that even if, let's say you're a teacher and living with a partner, you might not overtly be fired if someone finds out you're gay for that reason, but it could be for another reason. And I think people do live in fear that they wouldn't be accepted. Um, and, and also I think rural people that are questioning their sexuality or living as a lesbian are isolated from the types of things that heterosexual people take for granted, like going to a baby shower and being with your partner in the open or going to a park and kissing someone on the cheek. Those types of things um, involve, um, you know, other realities that they wouldn't relate to. So I think that another theme from this exhibit is that I think 
queer people feel that they have to conceal their relationships and their identity. Um, so I hope that by looking at this work, this helps to promote social justice for this community by reaffirming a shared experience of rural, rural um, queer people, providing an opportunity for discussion, social networking, and validation. Um, some of the themes that might come across as you're looking at his artwork could be isolation, lack of resources, discrimination, and violence that I think queer people could feel living in a rural community. Um, but I also think that there's a universal theme that you could get, which is that psychologists often tell us we, um, as humans, want to be loved unconditionally by our parents and our, and our community and the people that we love. And for queer people in particular, that can be a point of, um, you know, a turning point in your life when someone that's supposed to love you unconditionally thinks your life is immoral. And that, that has a big impact, I think, on your acceptance and your psychological development, your identity development. But in some sense, we all seek love and unconditional love from, from our parents and our colleagues and our communities. And so that longing for having that can be another theme that we all see in his art. And with that, I will introduce you to David Kubi, and I hope that you can all take, get a chance to look at his work. Thank you. Hi everyone. How's it going? Yeah. Good. You guys see it all right? Okay. Um, how many people in here are artists? Let me just see. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so, you know, I want to talk about, about being an artist because I think that's more what my focus is on, um, and I'll kind of get into that a little bit more. Um, but when I was studying art in school, um, and now as a professor, what I've realized um, about art, especially photography, is that it really involves two passions, right? You can't just have the passion to create because creating is, is one factor there, but there has to be something else beyond the surface. Um, and again, that's really um, important for photography because the image has to stand for something else. Um, sometimes these can be more concrete ideas such as um, science, politics, religion, um, etc. Sometimes it can be stuff that corresponds to visual aesthetics such as form or color or fashion. But again, it always has to come from another place. It can't just be the urge to create. Um, and oftentimes this is really one of the most difficult things for people to come to, even though it's usually the most obvious. It's like, what is your what are you passionate about besides just being somebody who creates something, right? There's got to be something else in there. Um, and for me, it was, it was obviously the, the whole gay aspect and how that identity plays out um, and who I am. Um, so let's start with, um, with this quote here. Um, the societal experience of gay people is one in which they have to be more aggressive about finding the people they belong with, their tribe. The family is not an automatic substitute for their tribe. Um, what I really love about this quote um, is it really has the same sentiments that I felt as a child growing up. Um, the family structure, which most people, even in minority statuses, um, they grow up in a family that also shares that minority experience. But for gay people, they don't have that immediate association. They see their parents, typically a man and a woman, maybe sometimes a single parent, but um, oftentimes it doesn't reflect their own sexual orientation. And so, um, again, they have to be more aggressive about that. They have to um, really struggle. And what I realized when I was growing up is that I sort of wanted to belong to a tribe. Um, it wasn't anything about sexuality or anything along those lines. It was just the need to be um, part of a tribe. And of course I can say that I was labeled into um, a tribe of Catholic or a tribe of white or a tribe of male. Um, there's a bunch of different categories that I could sort of correspond with. But when I think back to it, um, I think I wanted something different from the status quo. 
I wanted a tribe that I belonged to that um, was different than my own family setting. Um, and although that seems maybe a little bit isolating and depressing, um, for me it sort of fit within the grooves of who I am as a person. Um, and I'm not really for sure if, um, if I was just born to go against the grain or, um, or if being gay sort of furthered that, that longing for me or that um, sense of who I was. Um, but either way, being gay put me into a different tribe. It, it set me apart from the normal tribe in which I was sort of placed. Um, and of course, that's a very scary and also liberating thing. Um, and so it took me really years to sort of figure out that this was the perfect combination to, um, to merge with my artwork. And when I look at my artwork, especially now, I sort of see it as a timeline, right? Because we all change, right? I change from today um, to tomorrow, um, from years back. And so I look at this work as sort of a timeline because a lot of these viewpoints that I held when I made this work don't necessarily fit with who I am anymore, right? Um, and the other thing is, I don't consider myself an activist. I know this is kind of about social justice and about being gay and sort of explaining all that, um, but I'm not an activist. Um, in fact, some of my work in the past, um, I've sort of questioned um, its intention because I've sort of shun a negative light on the community that I belong in, because again, I like to go against the grain, and so, um, so I've sort of pushed on those boundaries that were already present in this thing that was off the boundaries anyways. Um, so let me start with industrial pride. Um, and this was really the first body of work that I created that, um, that really sort of dealt with the queer or gay themes, and I'll talk about queer here in a little bit. Um, but this sort of dealt with, with gay themes. Um, it actually started when I was taking just photos with a digital camera, and I noticed that not, at night I would get this kind of orange glow. And so what I started to do was I started to sort of take pictures of these construction or isolated kind of settings, and I tried to let the camera sort of do the work and find the lighting for me. So um, most of you are probably familiar with Photoshop. None of these images were Photoshop. They were all just manipulated with the camera and the settings within the digital camera. Um, and so what happened is I tried to get all the colors of the rainbow. Right? So the rainbow being a sign for gay pride. But what I also think is important about these is that um, the setting that I actually took them in, right? They're sort of these desolate, isolated places. And being part of the Midwest um, goes into this work a lot because being in the Midwest, there's not a big community. So what I felt was this sort of isolation, but still this sense of pride for who I was. So the colors sort of represent this vibrancy, this passion, but then the isolated settings sort of represent the state of mind that I was in at the time. So here they are all together. Um, relationship diet. So this is um, one of the bodies of work that I really sort of questioned um, what I was doing and what I was trying to accomplish. Um, what I essentially did was I sort of equated dieting and cupcakes to the ideas of a relationship. So um, I, I'm really skinny, as some of you can see. Um, so I have no idea about diets. Um, as Mark will tell you, my husband over there, um, that I keep a thing of York peppermint patties by the bed, um, like a big container, and I just, I just eat them. I mean, like, like so I have no sense of, of what's, what's kosher and what's, you know. Um, and so I wanted to relate that experience from a different vantage point. So um, I have this cupcake, and it's, the first one is sort of this being single, right? You have this cupcake in front of you, and you're like, mm, do I want to eat it? Do I don't want to eat it? Um, there's sort of this tension that's, that's happening there. Um, and all of them, I put these sort of nutrition facts, and you can't really read them from here, but I was being really clever. Um, and, uh, and I put... Um, like, I changed nutrition facts for um, whatever I thought that sort of relationship equated. Um, so, for instance, this one was all about hooking up. So it's like you take a bite out of the cupcake, you toss it um, in the bin. Um, sugar was so high on that because, you know, sugar is delicious and it's fun. And, um, 
right. Um, then we have sort of the, just the, the bite, right? That sensual sort of taking your time with it, um, having this, um, this moment with the cupcake, right? Um, <laughs> this one, um, what I, and this is the one that maybe sort of questioned um, what I was doing it specifically. Um, because a lot of times in gay relationships, since you have people of the same gender, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's common, but um, there's definitely the, the idea of having a multiple facet relationship. So a relationship with three people potentially instead of uh, the two, right? So in this case, I'm sort of savoring this one, but I also have, I'm holding these other two relationships in my hand as I'm enjoying one. So, um, and then I have sort of the cheating, right? Because, which is sort of standard to, um, to a lot of, um, a lot of relationships. So I have the one behind my back and I'm eating the other one. And then of course this one's the breakup. How dare, how dare he, right? Um, but what I, what I like about this body of work is I think that a lot of these images are very universal, right? And I don't try to sort of, you know, I'm not gonna like, you know, take pictures of these men and, you know, all naked. That's not my, my goal, it's, that's sort of boring to me. Um, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to um, sort of show this sort of universal image, um, but also have these gay subtexts that, that are present in the work. Um, love relationship, this one I, I rarely show, but, um, but I do kind of like it sometimes. Um, so what I was interested in was on gay profiles, which gay people sort of invented online dating, I think. Um, and um, you're welcome. And, um, <laughs> what I find interesting, um, or what I found interesting at the time was I would go on these profiles and these people would say that they're looking for, and the category was love slash relationship. Um, but what I found interesting is that all the pictures that they showed were of their genitalia. And I was thinking, well, that's, that seems like it's a, it's a mixed message, right? Um, so I tried to sort of reimagine these scenes um, from these images that I see on the profile. So in this case, the meat being measured up to, to a ruler, you know, there's those pictures. Um, there's this one, which is pretty suggestive, right? Um, I don't think I need to explain it too much, but... Um, Is this one? Feeding frenzy, right? Um, see what I mean by like maybe betraying my community? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of going against the grain a little bit here. Um, just a little, just a little peek, okay? Not... No laughs on that one. Um, so this one was like a toy, you know? Like that was a dog toy I found at a pet store, but I thought it was perfect. So, um, so it's sort of like an imitation for, for the real thing. And, and really the reason I don't show these too often is because they're just so similar to each other in a way. There's not a lot of variety, so. Um, so those were sort of my undergrad um, bodies of work. And then I went to grad school and um, I went to Philadelphia. So moving from Springfield to Philadelphia, it's a big change, um, big community, big city, um, lots of gay folk around. So that was, um, that was interesting. Um, so these things write themselves. Um, these are shot with black and white film. And then um, the way I display them is I display them with um, black on the top and the bottom. So it looks almost like a widescreen perspective. And they kind of reference uh, film noir um, inside of these. And what I like about these is that um, a lot of them, that's the only one that doesn't have subtitles. These other ones, um, I work with text to give it um, some sort of a meaning, but it's not enough of a meaning to hit you over the head. You're sort of left wondering um, what this story is about. And every time I would display these, I would rearrange the order. So one time this might be first, um, the next time this might be in the middle. And so depending on what images were next to it, it would sort of change the story. Um, so in this one, it says, I swear this, was not, this wasn't anything I planned. Um, this one, 
why don't you just give it a try? And then the other person says, there's just no way I can handle anymore. Uh, Dave, just relax. I'll take, a bit, take care of everything while you're gone. This one's probably my favorite. Well, this one's the cursed one. Like every time I try to display it, something always happens to it. It ruins it. But, but I just love it. I just love that loud music playing. It's just sort of this, um, this audio thing that you get from seeing that. Uh, it's been a long day for both of us. Maybe we should just do this another time. Well, him and I still pretend to be friends, uh, but I know we're not anymore. Why didn't you stay out with the rest of us? So again, as you can see, if, if these were switched around in a different order, um, the story would sort of change, and that's where the title of these things write themselves, because depending on who's viewing them and in what order they're viewing them in, um, everything sort of changes. Okay. Oh, and this is, this is one of my favorites. Uh, within one night, my life became divided between the person I was and the... So I sort of leave that, that hanging there um, to sort of um, make the viewer sort of associate in their mind what, what else their life was divided between. So. Uh, no, it's been over 40 minutes now. It's my stalker one. It's like I'm <laughs> stalking somebody, right? All right. Um, so queering the landscape. Um, before I discuss this, um, I want to kind of talk about the word queer, because in different settings it means different things. Um, sometimes queer sort of becomes this umbrella for um, LGBTQIA, um, if you've heard those letters before, lesbian, gay, bisexual. Um, sometimes it just becomes this umbrella statement where you can say, oh, you know, I'm queer, and it sort of means that you're you fit within one of those categories. But in academia, um, queer means something a little bit different. Um, typically, queer um, is about sort of destroying definitions and labels. So by associating as a gay person, I'm sort of associating myself with a label that I don't control. Society sort of controls what the definition of gay means. So the purpose of queer is to sort of destroy what, what that, any definition, right? So if I say I'm queer, it's meant to, in a way, elude you and not really give you any definition because by defining myself, I'm sort of putting myself in this category, okay? Um, so you can sort of take it to mean either one, depending on how you want to view it. But um, for this, there's this, this great quote, um, to make invisible possibilities and desires visible, to make tactic things explicit, to smuggle queer representation in where it must be smuggled, and with the relative freedom of adulthood, to challenge queer eradicating impulses where they are to be so challenged. It's a tongue twister. Um, but basically it's, it's about sort of injecting this queer into, into these places that aren't specifically queer. And for this body of work, um, it's very fitting. And what I did is I um, took pictures of areas in which I grew up, um, so this is all like Springfield and sort of the outskirts of Springfield. And I want to take these pictures um, and sort of inject a queer presence in them. Okay, now you're probably saying I don't see any queer presence in them. Um, and part of it is the title. Okay, the title gives away, and I'll read the title for these, um, gives away what this image is about and what makes it queer. But I was also interested in this idea of can can I do this? Can I put in a queer representation where there's this area that has no queer representation at all? So in this case, it's um, called bathhouse. So bathhouses are infamous for uh, particularly gay men to sort of go and have casual sexual encounters. And I just love this where you have these little spigots and they look like they're kind of grabbing each other's spigot and then you have this, this hole, this sort of orifice here, which is um, just really sort of nice and subtle. Um, BDSM, so bondage, um, Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really hard to see, but, but you have all these wires that are sort of attached to it, so it's kind of 
um, holding it in place. Um, the gay agenda. Um, this one, I was interested in sort of, um, first off, I was interested in the 10%. You know, like, there's, they say that there's 10% of the population is gay. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll visually represent 10% down here. But also, I was thinking of how ridiculous it seems, like, like the gay agenda, like, okay, this is, this is us, this is you, like, you know, how are, how are we a threat in a way? Um, don't ask, don't tell. So they just seem shady back there and sort of like they're hiding. Bear. So um, a bear in the gay community is usually a um, heavier set, hairy, uh, hairy guy. So I was really interested in this. Down here it looks kind of like, like fur and then... Um, and this is like the, the most I could find of like wavy landscapes in the prairie. So, um, you know, I like the curves of, of that. Um, fag hag, okay. Um, fag hag is usually sort of the backbone of the gay community. It's um, usually a female friend that, um, uh, that sort of tags along and um, is very supportive. So one of these is the fag hag and the other one is, of course, the fag, right? Um, at first, I was afraid. I was petrified, right? Um, so, seems to be "I will survive" seems to be this sort of gay anthem, um, and I like this sort of barn that's been sort of through a lot, but the one next to it has been demolished, and so it's sort of moved beyond that and sort of embraced its, its structure in a way. God hates fags. Some of these places might look familiar if you're from Springfield. Um, but all these sort of do not enter signs, it's just like sort of warning. It just reminded me of those protesters as they're sort of picketing. Usually there's about that many protesters anyways, because they don't really have a huge following, but um, Flamer. Right? That gay barn right there. <laughs> I mean, how dare him be that green, right? <laughs> Um, Russian roulette. Uh, so this was kind of about HIV and AIDS, and sort of this this sign that says, you know, warning, electrical, um, and people still sort of go beyond that that grid. They sort of um, take away that protection occasionally and sort of risk. So um, the eagle. Okay, the eagle is usually any big city um, that you go into. Um, there's usually a leather bar called the Eagle. I don't know why, but um, but I thought these like these macho butch um, equipment kind of around this watering hole was um, pretty interesting. Intersexed. Um, so intersex is um, people who are born with sort of questionable um, genitalia. So it's not clear if they're male or female, um, and so. There's this idea that you have to be one or the other, right? You have to be either male or you have to be female. But what I love about this is there's still this like road, right? There's still something back there that you can, you could go, but you have to sort of jump over some barriers and, and get there. Um, Kinsey, if you're familiar with uh, Alfred Kinsey and the Kinsey scale, um, there's sort of this um, gay on one side, straight on the other, and then sort of whatever falls in between. Okay, so. um, love makes a family. So I love these, these two trees that are way totally different than these other trees. It's like they're adopted kids that, you know, that they're raising, but they make a family despite, despite all that. Open relationship. So um, again, the queer community is somewhat known for being a little bit more relaxed when it comes to sexuality. And so you have these two people that are connected to each other, but then there's also this sort of opening um, to allow other people in, um, in a sexual sense. Flagging. Uh, flagging is this term where you sort of give off the signals. Um, so maybe it's a hanky in the back pocket, which sort of suggests um, that you're into one thing or another. Um, 
maybe it's an earring, which I don't think is really relevant anymore, but there's different ways in which the gay community sort of talks to each other, um, and simple things that most people would not get. Um, it's sort of um, Larry Craig, the toe tapping, right? You guys heard about that, right? In the bathroom, toe tapping, that's another form of flagging. Family and, man. Um, uh, this is my beauty right here, Tina. Um, so uh, Tina is uh, also the street name for methamphetamine, um, which meth is a problem all over, but it becomes really problematic for the gay community because um, they take Tina and then they have unprotected sex because of it, and it spreads AIDS um, and HIV a lot quicker. So um, I just love that kind of ridiculously blue sky with this thing that's rotted out and most meth heads, you know, their teeth start rotting out because of, of the drug. Um, unnatural. So this is another one where, um, you know, the preachers are like, well, you're unnatural, you're not procreating. And so I, I like this sort of road end. Um, but again, you sort of have these outs that you can adopt. Or, um, there's different families, of course. So. Um, Friends of Dorothy, right? so Yellow Brick Road, um, Wizard of Oz. Um, Friends of Dorothy is a, um, another name for gay people. Call them, call them Friends of Dorothy or Mary. Sometimes, sometimes gay people call each other Mary, but, um, but Friends of Dorothy is a good, um, good title. Okay. Um, things they said, this was a, a really short-lived body of work. Um, and I probably would have continued it, but I sort of settled down and then I didn't really have that, um, that muse anymore. But um, these were conversations I had, um, either online or through text message or email. So um, what these text messages are, are they are from um, another person. Um, and then I sort of took a photograph to sort of visualize my response to what they said. Um, so this one says, I know you didn't like our conversation yesterday. I know I hurt my boy. But I also knew uh, we had reached the point. I needed to tell you, and you have no clue how hard it was and how much it hurt me. Um, I was so glad to see you again. If you get permission to be polyamorous, I hope I can be on your list. I would love to sleep with you again and hold you again. Of course, I kept the spelling in there because I wanted it to be clear that it was um, from some sort of an instant message or a text. Um, um, I think it's shitty that you couldn't find a fucking minute to call me today. Maybe we're on different pages. That's all. That was short. Right? Um, so super secret. This was another one where um, I sort of questioned my intentions a little bit. And um, I got the idea of watching Spider-Man. Um, which all good ideas come from Spider-Man, I assume. Um, but I was, I was interested in my reaction to watching it and how Spider-Man was like fighting his urge to tell Mary Jane about who he was. And I was thinking, that's really interesting. There's a good parallel between the gay community and being in the closet. And so I was really interested in this comparison of, you know, the superhero is, um, you know, going out and fighting crime and, um, you know, he keeps his, he or she keeps their identity hidden um, to sort of protect their family and their loved ones. And I thought that was an interesting comparison to men in the closet, um, specifically like men who are maybe married and sort of putting their spouse at risk. And so um, I kind of came to it with this sort of negative perspective. And as the body of work kind of grew, um, I sort of became a little bit more compassionate for, for these men and the situation that they were in. And what I did with these is I, um, um, I shot um, the figures with film, which gives a really crystal clear um, sort of definition of the figure. Um, and then I use the digital um, image for the background, which gives this kind of pixelated quality. So what I really wanted, I, I really wanted them to sort of stand outside of their background, because I wanted it to look sort of awkward and that they didn't fit into that setting. 
All right, so now lines of division. Um, so the show out there, um, it's a mixture of two bodies of work. Okay. Um, one of them was a work I did in grad school. It was actually my thesis, which is the pieces that you can move around. Um, the other one is a brand new body of work, so if I don't talk too coherently about it, that's, um, it's because I only did it last month. And uh, so it's, it's really, really new. Um, and what I was interested in is I was interested in pairing these two bodies of work and sort of seeing how they relate to each other. Um, if, um, how they interacted, if there were any common themes within the work, um, and how they sort of relate to my own identity and my current place and time with how I think about the world. Um, both of them, I think, deal with identity, sort of from different perspectives. Um, the exquisite queer, which is the, the figures. Um, and those are a little bit more carefree, a little bit more fun. Um, and then um, the other one, which is called A Healthier Shade of Yellow, um, is a little bit more haunting, a little bit more static. Um, there's not a lot of movement. It's a little depressing. Um, at least that's the way I kind of look at it. Um, so the exquisite queer. I remember I sort of um, used that term sort of in a weird way. Um, so it started from the idea of the exquisite corpse. Anybody familiar? Anybody ever heard of the exquisite corpse? Um, basically what it is is it was a game that the surrealist artists would play where um, they would basically divide a piece of paper into three, three sections. And so one person would draw on this piece, okay? And then they'd pass it to the next person, the next person would draw, they would see this top piece and then they would continue the drawing, and they'd fold it over and then pass this along. So the person who was drawing the third panel would only see this piece. They wouldn't see the top. So what happens is, and you can do many variations of this, um, but what happens is you sort of start to get these things that don't really exist. It's sort of this new creation that, that forms. So this text piece, um, and this honestly might be one of my favorite pieces I've ever created, just because I think it's, it's just so simple, um, but there's something so queer about it that I could never do on my own. Um, and so what I did is um, the models for, if you guys have flipped through the book, um, what I did with the models is I started this off um, with the exquisite queer is. And I sent that to one of my models and had him respond to it. And so what he said is a complete myth. And so then I took a complete myth and I sent it to the next person and they put in the making. And so basically everywhere that there's bold versus um, just regular font, it's a different person's voice. So, and again, they can only see the line that was before it. So as it starts to go further and further, it breaks down, which I think is really um, interesting in regards to queer theory and sort of the academic nature of, of the term queer, where you sort of have this breakdown of identity. So let me just read this to you. Uh, the exquisite queer is a complete myth in the making of a hot good man who remembered to always kindly assess the situation before he acted was nothing like he thought it was, better than he had ever imagined. Even though it was obvious he could never afford it, he took a huge loan against his better judgment and lived to regret it. Next time he'll not leave the house all dressed in red. He'll leave the house to the shock of the neighbors with nothing on at all. Toward the sidewalk colored sky threatening rain, there is no hope for a warm sun today. If you tell my mother everything, she may get jealous or excited to be cuddling in his arms, wishing he had used some deodorant and hoping he had some stash in the car. He dashed for the driver's side door, but disappointedly, all he found were two condoms. I mean, so brilliant. Like, I just, I mean, there's no other way to put it. It just, it just reeks of queer, and I just, yeah. So, um, so again, it's, it's, it's a really important piece for me because I think it really sums that up. Um, so this was actually my grad program, and you don't really need to see that many pictures because you are experiencing it. But um, and all these men um, are gay men that I posted on Craigslist, tried to get models to come into my basement and get their picture taken. Um, <laughs> and. Um, same with the closeted men. Those are those guys are a lot harder to find. Um, but um, 
But so anyway, so I was... Um, so I wanted to focus just on, on gay men, which sort of defeats the purpose of queer, because again, queer sometimes can be this all-encompassing. Um, but I sort of photograph and make work based on my own experience, and this was sort of my experience. Um, so obviously this work um, can be about stereotypes, right? There's, that's like the Pollyanna version is like, okay, well, um, you know, you, you try to fit the same gay part into another gay part and it doesn't necessarily fit. Um, you know, and there's, there's that to it. Um, but I was also interested in, um, in childhood, right? So um, if you've played with the book or if you've even played with the, the pieces, they're kind of this childhood activity um, that's kind of fun to, to interact with. And, um, and so I was really interested in um, what happens if you take this sort of childhood toy, this childhood experience, um, but you infuse it with this sort of adult content, which I think is a good experience, or not a good experience, but an experience that uh, gay people often experience uh, because they're sort of growing up and they notice that they're different from, again, their tribe. And so they're sort of forced into this different um, different world that's, that's adult in content and, um, and a lot different. Here's some. It's not as funny since you've already seen it, right? All right, so a healthier shade of yellow. Um, so what this work um, is really kind of about is the sense of completion. Um, I went to grad school, sort of graduated, um, moved back to, I moved to Peoria actually, um, a little bit outside of Springfield. Um, I was in a relationship. I was ultimately really happy, but the problem was that I had nothing to rebel against, and my whole life was sort of this struggle that's going against the grain. Um, and so I became really conflicted in my identity as an artist because all of my past work has sort of dealt with this struggle, this trying to figure out who I was or where I fit in, and now I felt like I reached that pinnacle, that happiness, and I didn't really know where I fit in. So the title, Healthier Shade of Yellow, we certainly, we usually don't associate yellow with healthy, right? It seems like jaundice or really disgusting. There's sort of this, um, this bad sensation when you think of yellow, right, as in, in referring to a person. So, um, so I like the idea that it's, it's healthier, but it's healthier in a different way. It's healthier in a, in a distorted way. Um, so mimesis um, is really about this sort of mimicking of, of some other action, right? And so here I'm mimicking um, heteronormativity, sort of this, um, the norm of heterosexuality. And so I'm really interested in, um, in this because I love this sort of distorted background, right? It sort of warps everything and it's not crystal clear. Um, it's sort of this interesting, interesting dilemma, for me at least. Um, and what I was really interested in with this is sort of this um, happiness and complacency versus passion and struggle. Right? And it really got me thinking about the gay community in general. And it's really interesting the point that we're at because there's all this acceptance now we have Glee, we have the new normal, right? The, this new show that is this gay couple adopting, the new normal, right? I mean, what's happening is the gay community is sort of assimilating into, um, into this heteronormative society, right? And so it's sort of scary in a way because there's something really unique about the gay community. And my concern is that even though it's great that we're becoming equal and we're becoming accepted, um, there's also this sort of sense of loss. Um, and I think I felt that in my own personal life, right? This being married, um, you know, having a job, being a somewhat successful artist, as, as successful as one usually becomes. Um, and so it, it, was, it was this loss of identity that happened. And so, so that's kind of how I tie this back to, to the gay community. Um, and of course, this work is probably the most personal work I've ever, I've ever done. I sort of have 
put my relationship on on a pedestal in a way. Um, and I really tried to um, sort of position myself outside of my own life, outside of my existence and sort of document um, my world. So here we have this leather harness, um, which if you're in the leather community, it's sort of this, you know, this strap thing that goes um, on your chest. And it's sitting wrapped around this chair. It's, it's stuck there, right? Um, but then you also have this kind of bed back here, and then you have this calendar. And it's all about time. It's all about um, sexuality, but it's, it's also very static. It's, it's very unmoving. Um, white flag. Um, I was interested in this, this red cow, which sort of represents passion, but you have all this other white to sort of closing in on it. This is sort of the, the heteronormativity and sort of the queer, and it's sort of becoming enclosed. And of course, the title, White Flag, makes you focus on the smaller element, not the bigger element. Um, it's about giving up, in a way. Um, vestige. Um, so this is um, really about sort of trying to delete evidence or um, delete this mark that's always present. Mm -hmm. um, and what I tried to do was I tried to sort of angle this directly to this piece right here, which is the webcam, which is um, something that gay people also, I think, invented um, before Skype, right? Uh, and it was this way to um, sexually explore somebody from your PC, right? And so, um, obviously, this has some, something to do with sexuality, it has to do with sex, and the sort of shredding of of that. Um, and then two and one, sort of this foundation that's sort of cracking at the seams. Um, and there's these two that are sort of patching it up. But then there's this one that's off the, off the timeline, off the, um, that crack that sort of interjects itself. Questions? Or are you? Go oh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess I did my job then, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, it it kind of depends. For Queering the Landscape, um, I had a whole list of titles that I was looking for. Um, and me and Mark would kind of drive around and try to find stuff. Um, for this last body of work, um, I'm really shooting things a little bit differently. I'm going more off of instinct. And I'm just sort of taking these pictures of these things that sort of get stuck in my head. And then I'm sort of titling them later. So, some, so it sort of depends. Um, What's happening? Um, All right. Any other? Right, like the the ones where I'm physically in them, not not emotionally in them. Um, um, yeah, you know, I I think part of it is convenience. It's like I'm the I'm the model, so um, so in some cases it is very much a self portraiture kind of venture. But um, I sort of think of of it just as this figure that stands in. I don't necessarily view it as necessarily a self-portrait, if that makes I, I actually find like these last five bodies of work in the show here, um, I find those more self-portraits than I do of the these things write themselves or the relationship diet. Like 
I don't see myself in those as much as I see myself in the ones that don't actually have me. You know? So, yeah. Because I, I think, I mean, part of it is I think I've built myself as an identity around being an artist. And part of the inspiration that I've always come to has been um, making work. And um, that's been sort of my catharsis, is making work. And so um, since graduating, I've sort of had the struggle of trying to make work again. And I think part of it is because there's, there's this complacency. I, um, and without, with complacency, there's sort of this struggle of, you know, trying to find inspiration. And so that's part of it, I think. Um, but I mean, I think there's also, you know, becoming married, if anybody in here is married, there's sort of this loss of identity that happens, right? You become merged with somebody else. And so there's, in a way, a death. Right? I'm sure Mark doesn't like me saying that, but, but he knows me. He does. Um, so, okay. All right. Anyone else? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I I guess the way I'll answer that, which I don't know if it really is an answer to your question, but um, I mean, I shoot with film um, as opposed to digital. Um, I actually have a camera that has the the accordion bevels. If anybody's familiar, seen those in like history books. Um, it's a newer camera, but it's, um, it basically has these bevels that um, create the picture. I have to go under a dark cloth to sort of see the image that I'm composing. Um, and so I think there's something with that medium that makes a lot of these photos seem very static and um, devoid of movement because what happens is when I create these images, um, it takes me at least 20 minutes to set up the camera, to set up the location, to sort of figure out exactly what I want it to be. And unlike digital, I have one shot, and each shot costs me five bucks, which isn't necessarily a factor, but you know, like I want to be exact whenever I take that photo, because, you know, I, yeah. So, so digital allows you to sort of take a bunch of rapid fires, and you can sort of pick out the best one. The photographs that I take do sort of have the static because they're, um, I think that's the nature of the camera that I use. So. Does that answer it at all? Yeah. Care? Oh, I found it really interesting when you said that your work is very dark to people and that you were almost, you know, raging against things. And that's where you were finding your work and that's where you were finding something to communicate. Right. But now you're finding yourself without a rage, right. almost, and it, it's turned more into a sense of questioning. Right. What happens when you don't have anything to fight? You know, where does the work come from? Right. And, and is that scary to you? Oh, no, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that's part of what this new body of work is, is it's really, you know, I, I usually take photos with a really clear sense in mind of what I'm photographing and what the purpose is and like I have it all planned out in my head. And now I sort of have been taking photos where it's very much based on instinct. I just sort of take something that I'm really sort of fascinated by visually and then um, I sort of work with what that means later on in a way. But I guess that's maybe a way to answer that. It's, it's definitely a different way of producing work that I'm really unfamiliar with, but, um, but that's what I've had to do. I've had to sort of push 
my boundaries to a new place. So. What do you want to know? <laughs> um, um, so I did a BA, um, and I actually did it in graphic design. I didn't even do it in photography, but um, graphic design got a little boring for me. You kind of get burnt out with that really easily. And I was more interested in doing fine art. And so um, I started just taking photos just sort of as a whim. and. Um, that really sort of stuck with me, and um, I mean, I don't know. I, uh, good question. I mean, it's a loaded question. I mean, uh, you know, make sure that your portfolio is really cohesive, right? I mean, um, you know, and apply to a lot of schools. That's that's what I did. I applied to I think nine schools, and I got accepted to to maybe four, four and a half. Maybe. I say four and a half. I say four and a half because, like, because I got on wait lists, you know, and so I had to wait to hear. But, um, you know, and then grad school was, I, what I would say is in as terms of advice is that I was at a program where I was sort of left to fend for myself in undergrad. And so, like, I sort of developed what I wanted to do um, for grad school. Um, and I think that's really important is to, um, is to have a clear idea of what you want to do. Uh, I know people who have gone to grad school and they sort of are just going because it's the next step. And a lot of times they'll say later, like, I wish I was older when I went to grad school because I would have known more. And for me, I sort of already knew my destination. I knew what my work was about. It was just sort of developing it further. And so, um, so that would be my big advice is make sure that you have a clear idea of what you want your work to be about. Even if that changes later on, you should at least sort of have an idea and then you can sort of work through that through grad school. So. I did not. I went straight from a Bachelor in Arts to an MFA program. So. Well, thank you, everybody.